Let's begin at the beginning, and I mean at the very beginning. Let's think here for a moment. What is the historical perspective, culturally, sociologically speaking, about the origination of the universe? Well, in the ancient Near East, this would be the region surrounding and including the nation of Israel, they didn't believe that the universe had a beginning. They believed that the universe was just eternal. So Israel's neighbors, the Egyptians, the Babylonians, the Assyrians, et cetera, et cetera, they believed that the universe was just there forever. For example, Alexander Heidel, who is an Assyriologist, wrote this book, The Babylonian Genesis. This is on the Enuma Elish, which dates somewhere to 1700 BC. And this was the creation myth for the Babylonians and the Assyrians, respectively. And Heidel, a scholar of uh, this subject, writes this regarding the Enuma Elish. He says, Apsu, the freshwater male deity, and Tiamat, the saltwater female deity, represented the living, uncreated world matter. They were matter and divine spirit, united and coexistent like body and soul. Uncreated world matter. It is apparent that for the Babylonians, matter was eternal. Now, if matter is coexistent and conjoined with the world spirit, Apsu and Tiamat, that means that Apsu and Tiamat were eternal with the universe itself, yet the word of the Babylonian deities was not almighty. The Babylonians, the Assyrians, they didn't believe that the universe had an origin. Secondly, Western thought looked around at the world and they said, well, it's always been here. If you would ask someone like an Aristotle or a Plato, a, a Platonic thinking, Aristotelian thought, they just thought that the universe always existed. Aristotle came closer. He believed that there was a prime mover, a kind of an engine that the universe had to function through, but not a beginner. So there was a mover to the universe, kind of a logos, but not a beginner to the universe. And so on it went, down through the history of Western thought. So ancient thought, Western thought, so to Eastern thought, the pantheistic, monism, one essence. Pan meaning all and theism meaning God. Uh, this whole perspective was just that the universe is one and the same as God. So for Eastern thinkers, they just believed, you know, Hindus, Buddhists, uh, and Taoists, they just believed that the universe was eternal or that it went through a cyclical pattern, that, that time is not linear, it's instead cyclical. So we can read from the Vedas. These are the Hindu holy books. Whence is this creation? Gods came afterwards with the creation of this universe. Who then knows whence it has arisen, whether God's will created it or whether it was mute? Perhaps it formed itself or perhaps it did not. Only he who is its overseer in highest heaven knows, or perhaps he doesn't. So let's see how that compares with the Bible. You see, amidst this cultural milieu, ancient Near Eastern polytheism or henotheism, and then Western thinking, Aristotelian and Platonic thinking, and then uh, Eastern thinking, pantheism and monism, here you have this strange group of people called the Jews. It may be strange isn't the right way to put it. Unique, unique group of people. That in the beginning of their scriptures, it says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, which is a merism. Like, I love you from your head to your toes. Heavens and the earth and everything in between. The, the, the entire universe. That's from the law, the first five books, the Pentateuch. Then you have the writings, the Psalms. The psalmist writes, chapter 33, verse 6, the Lord merely spoke and the heavens were created. God breathed the word and all the stars were born. The law, the writings, and the prophets, Isaiah 45, 18, he who created the heavens, he is God. He says, I am the Lord and there is no other. What a strange, bizarre view to hold that God created the universe from what? Well, in the beginning. In the beginning of what? In the beginning. In the beginning of time, like God already existed. In fact, when we go over to the Christian scriptures, we read an allusion back to Genesis 1-1 from John. John, the first chapter, verse 1, he says, In the beginning was the Word, the Logos, 
And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him, and apart from him, nothing came into being that has come into being. What a strange, strange view. You've got everyone and their brother saying, now the universe has always been here. And you got this nomadic group of people, the Jews saying, no, God created the universe. And then the Christians just picked this right up and said, God created the universe. Now, <laughs> these people weren't astronomers, right? They weren't philosophers. If you went back and talked to David or Moses or Solomon, and you asked them, how do you know that God created the universe? You know what they would have said? God told us. God told us. Uh, he was there. He created it, and he communicated very clearly that he created the universe. Well, for millennia, this would have been absolutely intellectually embarrassing to hold as a view. Because you look around at the world, and for all intents and purposes, it looks like it's been here forever all until the 20th century hit. In the 20th century, we saw a complete revolution. They were handing out Nobel Prizes like, uh, uh, I don't have a good analogy there, <laughs> handing out Nobel Prizes like water at a race. I don't know. We'll go with that. <laughs> uh, 20th century, uh, all of a sudden, an avalanche of evidence was coming in. What sort of evidence? Well, First off, this actually predates the 20th century, but there was an observation that the second law of thermodynamics presupposes a non-eternal universe. What is the second law of thermodynamics? This law holds that energy is transferred or transformed to a state that is wasted. To put this more technically, it's unusable. It doesn't say that energy is gone away or it's destroyed. That's, that's the first law of um, uh, conservation of mass energy. Matter and energy cannot be created nor destroyed. The second law merely says that energy increasingly becomes non-usable. You cannot use it the longer time passes. So, as uh, the second law transpires, entropy or disorder increases to the point where energy is diffused. Are you with me? Okay, think of the show The Twilight Zone. Remember Rod Sterling? Every third episode was a guy coming into a small town in the middle of nowhere and nobody was there. You remember that? You go into a town, nobody's there, and the main character, whoever it was, William Shatner, some other guy, would walk into the town and he would see this. A cup of coffee, steaming. It's still hot. Ooh, and that would just make the, the chills go down your spine. That means, what's that mean? Maybe it means that that cup of coffee has been there from eternity past, steaming. No, there was an infusion of energy into the coffee pot, and then that brewed the coffee, and it's steaming, and it shows. What does it show? That someone was there a short amount of time ago. How long? I don't know how long a cup of coffee sits in a mug. 10 minutes, 15 minutes, steaming. But it shows that someone was just recently there. Or the character would come across this, a glass of ice water in the hot sun. So you've got the energy and the heat of the sun working against the cold of the ice, and that's moving toward diffusion and entropy, where the ice is, is being melted, and, and then it's becoming uh, equilibrium with, or equal to, that the heat of the, the hot sun and the, and the noonday. You know that somebody didn't put that out there from eternity past. Why? Because of the second law of thermodynamics. That's why. Well, what's true of the coffee cup, what's true of the ice water, is also true of the universe as a whole. When you look at the entirety of the universe and you see stars, these stars are on a half a tank of gas. Let me put that a different way. We know that these stars in our universe will not burn forever into the future. We know that. The, the nuclear fusion and the, the core of the stars will eventually expire. They'll either supernova or uh, just dissipate. They'll just become a graveyard of stars in our universe. We know that that's not going to happen into the future for eternity. What's that mean? That means this, that we know they haven't been burning forever in the past. That an infusion of energy needed to be put into the system of a closed universe to create stars, energy, heat, and light. So, Paul Davies could say this in 1978. He says, the universe is like a clock slowly winding down the problem is, how did it get wound up in the first place? How indeed? Where did this infusion of energy come from? 
Well, that's the second law of thermodynamics. Energy becomes less and less usable over time. Entropy increases, which presupposes an infusion of energy into our universe. Second, the general theory of relativity, not to be confused with the special theory of relativity, both by Albert Einstein, published in 1915 and then really became popular in 1917. According to Einstein, which still holds for today, large bodies of mass curve space and time. So maybe you saw Carl Sagan's series from the 70s where he threw a, a bowling ball onto a net and the net was completely straight, but when Sagan threw the bowling ball on the net, it curved inward. Or according to this picture here, we're seeing the same thing, aren't we? That because there's a large body of mass, it creates gravity, which actually curves space-time. Now, from this, what this means is, gravity would cause the universe to either collapse back in on itself or expand forever. What do I mean? If the universe exists in a static or inert state, gravity, the force of gravity, is going to be pulling on those stars. The whole idea of zero gravity is a misnomer. It's a misnomer. Uh, with zero gravity, I could be on Saturn and still be affected by the gravity on Earth. I know it's light, but there's still a slight, slight, slight pull. Well, eventually all the stars and the black holes and everything would be pulling each other closer and closer together, and closer and closer together, until eventually you'd have not a big bang, but a big crunch. Everything would go back together. Well, we're not observing that kind of a universe. We're observing a static, inert universe, according to Einstein. That was his theory, a static theory of the universe. But neither can we have the universe expanding outward forever. That would be a problem as well. That would imply a, uh, what's the word, um, a beginning. If the universe is expanding, that would mean that there was a beginning to the universe. So Einstein had to insert a cosmological constant. Because gravity was pulling the universe together, but it can't get pulled together, otherwise there'd be a big crunch. But it, neither can it be shooting apart, because then that would imply a beginning. He had to have a cosmological constant that was so finely tuned that if you moved one particle of matter from one part of the universe to the other, it would have resulted in disorder. Think of it like this. Throwing a basketball up into the air. It's either moving up against gravity, or it's coming down. But it's not just going to sit there and hover. The universe is either expanding outward, or it's contracting inward, but it's not going to stay in a static state, unless you've got a force pushing against gravity, while gravity is pushing against that force and keeping it perfectly stable. The problem with this, according to Einstein, is that this was completely ad hoc. Ad hoc is Latin. It means for this. For this. You're an ad hoc committee. Well, what are we doing here? Well, it's for this. this Einstein, why are we inserting a cosmological constant? Well, because we know that the universe is static. Why would we insert that? Well, because we know that it ha has to be working against gravity. Well, how do we know that the universe isn't either contracting or expanding? Later, Einstein referred to this as, quote, the biggest blunder of my life. His worldview was changing his approach to science. Let me repeat that. His worldview was changing his approach to science. During this time, 1922, 1927, two men, Alexander Friedman, who was a mathematician in Russia, and Georges Lemaitre, who is a Belgian astronomer, these two men, and a Jesuit priest, no less, independently looked at Einstein's general theory of relativity, which is fine. They were looking at its application to the universe itself, and both of them independently said, this isn't right. Lemaitre is here pictured with Einstein, talking to Einstein and saying, your math doesn't work out here. This isn't adding up. What we came to find was this was empirically demonstrated to Einstein by Edwin Hubble in 1929. Edwin Hubble had a, a telescope with a 100-inch mirror that could look out at the different galaxies and stars in the universe. And what he found was what he later became called Hubble's Law. Hubble's law. This refers to when light is being stretched away from us, it moves to the red shift of the spectrum. And when light is being compressed, that light wave is being compressed, it shifts to the other end, the blue side of the spectrum. Think of the Doppler effect, right? 
if you're on the side of the highway, as I've been many times with a flat tire and, you know, a big semi comes by, how does it sound? Did the, did the semi have a different pitch? No, it's the Doppler effect. It's when it was compressing toward me, those sound waves had a certain pitch, and then once they reached me, they had a different pitch, and when they receded away from me, they had still a different pitch. Are you with me? The same thing is true of light. What, what Christian Doppler discovered in 1848 also applies to light. Hubble's law is that these galaxies, the farther away they were, wherever he looked in the night sky, the faster they were moving. The farther, the faster. So, looking out here, you would see galaxies that were closer. They were more shifted toward the blue shift of the light spectrum. In the middle, they were more shifted toward the yellow. And finally, the ones furthest away, farthest away, were shifted toward the red. Or, oh, and here's Einstein with Hubble. Hubble looking every much like Sherlock Holmes, wondering, am I right? I'm talking to a theoretical physicist, and he's brilliant, and he's very nervously smoking his pipe, wondering if he's wrong. Hubble looks up into the night sky. He sees the evidence for himself. The universe is expanding. He said this in 1931, the red shift of the distant nebulae, nebulae, nebula is singular, nebulae, plural, have smashed my old construction like a hammer blow. I, this model I had, in theory, was one thing, but then I looked through the telescope and it's something completely different. Here we've seen this in NASA's telescopes. They've picked out the different galaxies that are farther away, and each one of them fits with Hubble's law. It shows that these galaxies that are far away are actually accelerating away from the viewer. Now, at this point, the scientific community had a pushback. They said if there was some kind of a, a big explosion, what Fred Hoyle called a big bang, a big bang, which, which was a pejorative term and for Hoyle, he said, you're just saying this all blew into existence? It's like a big bang. And people said, great name. We'll keep that. And that's how we got the term big bang theory from Fred Hoyle. He never believed in it until the day he died. Anyways, if this was the case, if the universe blew into existence from nothing, Ralph Alpher, who was a cosmologist in 1948, he said, if this is true, we would expect to see from such a hot, uh, dense explosion, we would expect to see cosmic background microwave radiation. Think about if your kids were playing in your garage or your patio or your bedroom, I don't know what you want to pick, but you, you come into the room and you didn't see the fireworks go off and you didn't hear them go off, but you smell the sulfur and you see the smoke. You would know where there's smoke, there's fire, or in this case, fireworks. In this case, if there was a big bang, there would be residue, cosmic microwave background radiation. And Alfers, or Ralph Alfer said that we should expect to see this, and if we don't see it, that would be a good reason not to affirm the Big Bang. Well, guess what happened? 1965, you've got two radio astronomers, Arno Penzias and Bob Wilson, working for Bell Labs, and they were tasked with taking their antenna and pointing it out and, and studying the brightness of the sky. As they pointed their antenna out at the sky, they kept picking up a low hum. So Bob would turn to Arno and say, Arno, you know, turn it that way. Oh, they point the antenna, click it over there. Now what are you getting? All right, point it south. Point it north. Any way they pointed it, what did they find? They found background radio waves. And they thought, are there birds up in the antenna? Is it the Russians? You know, this is 1965. Is there a satellite? Is there something in deep space that's screwing up our antenna? They couldn't figure it out. So they called up a Princeton scholar who was working on the same subject by the name of Robert Dick. And they said, we've got this radio waves uh, everywhere we point our antenna. We can't figure it out. Robert Dick was looking for not radio waves, but microwaves. He couldn't find any. The microwaves of the Big Bang had turned into radio waves, and consequently, Arno and Penzias, or excuse me, Arno Penzias and Robert Wilson had discovered accidentally the residue of the Big Bang itself. 
They were given a Nobel Prize as a result. Penzias said this in 1978 after receiving the Nobel Prize. He said, after looking at this, my argument is that the best data we have are exactly what I would have predicted had I nothing to go on but the first five books of Moses, the Psalms, and the Bible as a whole. Finally, NASA's COB satellite. This satellite was launched into space to look out at the universe and see if it could visually pick up on this. And what they found was, yes, indeed, the universe wasn't at absolute zero. It was at 2.7 degrees above absolute zero, uniformly across the universe. It, now, you might say that's not very warm. It isn't in the coldness of space, but it's warmer than it should be. And this was the residue of the Big Bang itself. Since then, in 2013, they've taken pictures of this cosmic uh, microwave background radiation, and they found it with more and more detail, not less. So we've seen over time, this has only been more confirmed, not less confirmed. George Smoot, who was the director of this program, said this, quote, if you're religious, it's like seeing God. I don't know. I'm hoping for something better than those pictures. But for him, he said, this is like seeing the, the, uh, the, 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 the handiwork of God himself. Finally, philosophical evidence. I put this last because we're doing a class on the cosmological argument, and I feel like I have to include this, even though I don't use it. But here it goes. Ready? An actual infinite refers to a set of an actual infinite number of things. What I don't mean is that we're moving toward infinity, like in heaven. Every year we'll be moving a day closer and closer toward an actual infinite number. But at each point, it'll be finite. That's called a progressive infinite. I'm talking about an actual infinite, an actual infinite set. This cannot exist in physical reality. An actual infinite cannot exist in physical reality. You can't have an infinite set of marbles, an infinite set of protons, an infinite set of electrons. There is no such thing as an infinite set in reality. Now, you say, well, there's infinity. Of course there's infinity. You just get an eight and you turn it on its side. There you go, there's infinity. Sure, I, b I believe that. Set theory, mathematically, conceptually, we can have an actual infinite. And we can use this in engineering and physics and so forth. That's fine, I have no objection to that. The objection here is you can't have an actual infinite set in reality, instantiated in reality. What this means is, if the universe is eternal, and there's been an infinite number of successive events, we would never reach the present moment, right? Let me give you a thought experiment. This is good philosophy, but bad theology. Are you ready? I die, and because good people go to heaven and bad people go to hell, I'm a bad person, so I go to hell. And I'm down there in hell, and I turn to God, and I say, God, come on, I, I, I try to live a good life, and I try to do my best. Can't you give me a deal here, God? Come on. You know, I try and qu tw uh, tw twist God's arm, and of course, because this is American folklore religion, not Christianity, he says, sure thing, Rochford, you're not that bad of a guy. How about this? You count successively uh, one number after another to infinity, and I'll let you out. So I say, sure. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 50,001, 50,002, 50,003, 50,004, 623,001, 623,002, 1,263,001, 1,263,002, And just then I look over, and there's Jeffrey Dahmer. And Jeffrey Dahmer pulls the same card. He says, oh, look, Rochford got away with it. Well, I should try too. God, let me try this too. And God says, all right, Dahmer, I'll, I'll, if you can count to infinity by ones uh, successively, I'll let you out. So Dahmer says, okay, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. And I turn to God and I go, this idiot, he's so far behind me. He's way behind me, Dahmer. He's never getting out of here. But then I think for a second, 1.26 million counting toward an actual infinity. Neither of us is closer. You can't get to infinity from counting successively. J.P. Moreland puts it this way. Not even God can count to infinity through successive counting. Not even God. It's philosophically absurd. It would be the same as saying God can make two plus two equal, equaling five. That's the same thing that we're dealing with here. This is the way that the great German mathematician David Hilbert put it. 
He said, the infinite is nowhere to be found in reality. It neither exists in nature nor provides a legitimate basis for rational thought. The role that remains for the infinite to play is solely that of an idea. He's right about that. We can't have this in reality. It's absurd. Personally, I find this to be good evidence that the universe was not eternal. Here's my reason for not using it. You say it's good evidence. Yes. Why don't you use it? Because it isn't persuasive. It's distracting. I just gave you six scientific lines of evidence for why the universe had a beginning. I wouldn't want somebody to focus on the seventh line of evidence that's conceptual, confusing, and honestly can get you down a, a rabbit trail. Uh, I saw a Christian philosopher come to OSU, give a brilliant presentation, and he gave seven arguments for the existence of God, one of which was the ontological argument. It's a seven-premise argument leading to a conclusion. It's internally valid. It's sound. But everyone pounced on that argument, in my opinion, because it isn't cogent. It isn't persuasive. So instead of looking at the other six good arguments, they focused on the seventh. So I don't like using arguments that aren't persuasive or aren't cogent, even if they are valid and they are sound. So I wouldn't use this last one, but I feel like I'd be doing you a disservice if we didn't speak about it. All right, what does all this mean? This means that the universe had a space, time, and matter beginning. All of space, time, matter, and energy burst into existence, not from a basketball, not from a, a microscopic uh, point, from nothing, from zero space, from no time, no matter, no energy, coming into existence from nothing. And when I say nothing, I mean the absence of anything. I mean no thing. Some Physicists refer to this as infinite density, mass with zero space, from a timeless state to a, a state with time. This is called the standard Big Bang model or the friedman lemaitre model. Alexander Friedman, George Lemaitre. We can look at it like this. If we think about time going from left to right, and if we think about space going from bottom to top, the universe would be like this. It would be like... Uh, going back into a cone where there was a point zero. They call this T zero, meaning time zero, before which there was no time. And then from this moment, space and time came into being from nothing. Now, some people argue, was there more of an inflation at the beginning? Should it be really a cone like that? Or should it have been, at this point, more of an inflationary period and then it evened out over time? I don't know. The point is, there was a point at which there was no universe, and then a point where there was a universe. From nothing to something, from no time to time, from no space to space, no matter to matter, you get the point. Einstein's general theory of relativity says that matter and energy are linked together. Remember his famous uh, formula. E, energy, equals mass times the speed of light squared. So matter and energy are, are inextricably linked together. So you can't say I have energy without matter or matter without energy. The problem is matter and space are conjoined and linked together. You can't have matter without space to put it into. And likewise, space is curved by matter, as Einstein showed. Finally, space and time are linked together, as Einstein demonstrated. Uh, uh, time dilation, um, moving at the speed of light changes your perception of time. So, matter and energy are linked, matter and space are linked, space and time are linked. These are all one big package. This means that the universe came into existence. Does this threaten naturalism? Does this threaten naturalism? Naturalism is the belief that all that exists is nature. There's nothing beyond nature, nothing behind nature, nothing above nature. Would this threaten the idea of naturalism, that there is only physics and chemistry and nothing else? You better believe it. You better believe it. Look at this. <laughs> Arthur Eddington, who affirmed this view, he said, the notion of a beginning is repugnant to me. The expanding universe is preposterous, incredible. It leaves me cold. Philip Morrison, I would like to reject it. Fred Hoyle, this is a crackpot theory. He never once broke on this. He held to the steady state theory until he died. Jeffrey Burbage, he was the editor of Nature magazine. 
He said in 1989, anyone who's believing in the Big Bang is going off to follow the, quote, first church of Christ of the Big Bang. You don't think this was threatening to naturalism? Philosophically un unacceptable. It betrays the very foundation of science. It is indeed a strange conclusion. Yes, this was threatening, that's for sure. Yet it's true, it's definitely true. Here's Stephen Hawking and Roger Penrose. Almost everyone now believes that the universe and time itself had a beginning at the Big Bang. Paul Davies, agnostic, deist, physicist. The Big Bang was not just the origin of space, but the origin of time too. To repeat, time itself began with the Big Bang. If there was no time or place before the Big Bang for a causative agency to exist, what's that mean? A an agent, like if I said he's a free moral agent, that's someone who can act, someone who can do something. A causative, a cause or an agent to do something. There was no space, there was no time for an agent to cause anything. Then we must not attribute any physical cause to the Big Bang. Are you tracking here? There's no space for a phys It wasn't a race of space aliens, contra Elon Musk, okay? It wasn't uh, something physical that could have caused the universe. There's no physical agency. What's that mean? It must be a non-physical agency. God. Alexander Vilenkin. He wrote this in 2006. It is said that an argument is what convinces reasonable men, and a proof is what it takes to convince even unreasonable men. With the proof now in place, cosmologists can no longer hide behind the possibility of a past eternal universe. And then again in 2012, all the evidence we have says that the universe had a beginning. And again in 2012, regarding the other different models that people have put forward, none of these scenarios can actually be past eternal. We have no viable models of an eternal universe the bored guth vilenkin theorem gives reason to believe that such models simply cannot be constructed. In 2003, Arvin Bord, Alan Guth, and Alexander Vilenkin came together. They invited in Guth to be part of the trio, and they said, we're going to come up with a theorem that shows this, something very, very simple, extraordinarily simple. Any universe, a quantum start, an inflationary start, a multiverse, a uh, bubble universe, any universe, any universe that is on average expanding over time. That's the only criterion, not multiple criteria about this universe. Any universe with a single criterion that it's on average expanding over time requires a beginning. Now, you could push back the beginning a little bit if you want, but it requires an absolute beginning. He says at this point, the bored guth vilenkin theorem gives reason to believe that such models cannot be constructed. Well, that's the data. The question is, what makes the most sense of these data? So far, this study has been theologically neutral. Now, if you have a, a certain theological or philosophical perspective, you might be excited or you might be a little bit tense at this point because you can see where this is going. But let's flesh this out. This is just the science that I'm showing you. The question is, what makes the most sense of the science? It's not the science that is disputed. This isn't creation science, okay? We're not creating a museum. We're not building an ark, nothing like that. We're taking the secular data. We're looking at it and saying, how can you best explain this? It's the interpretation that's at stake. Like if you went to a crime scene and you're looking at all the different data there, uh, the forensic data and the blood splatter and the, the size of the shoe print. And, okay, all the data are there. The question is, who killed him? How do you explain it? Which worldview has the most explanatory power and the most explanatory scope? So in other words, explanatory power means that each bit of evidence, it explains it the best. If it was a size 13 shoe at the scene of the crime, and you had a guy that wore size 13s, that would be explanatory power, baby, right there. That that guy must have been the murderer. And, and scope means if you had 17 bits of evidence, which view helps explain the most of them? The most of them. So if I have one killer that could explain 15 out of the 17, 
and it could explain it the best, that would be great, wouldn't it? But if I had another guy or girl that was being accused that only explained three of the 17, that would have less explanatory scope. So which worldview explains it the best? Here's J.L. Mackey. He's a very famous philosopher in the late 20th century. He's an atheistic philosopher. This is from his book, The Miracle of Theism. He wrote this with regard to the cosmological argument. He said, quote, there is no good reason why a sheer origination of things not determined by anything should be unacceptable. Whereas the existence of a God, it should be with a big G, with the power to create something out of nothing is acceptable. Do you agree with that? Do you agree with that? Something, the, the origin of something not determined by, something popping into existence from nothing. Folks, that's metaphysically absurd. If you saw a, an elephant pop into existence in the middle of this room, you would say aliens, <laughs> magic, something, something, right? Even a bad explanation would be better than no explanation. But, but to say, no, nothing caused that. If we were sitting here right now and all of a sudden we heard a loud boom outside of this building, and it shook the entire walls. And, you know, we had dust coming down from the rafters. And all of a sudden, you know, we're, we're, alarms are going off. And you, you hear sirens going down the street. And one person says, uh, what caused that? And the other person says, nothing caused it. Now, just pay attention to the rest of this teaching. Nothing caused, something caused. Even a bad explanation is better than no explanation. The existence of a God with the power to create, that's, that is not acceptable, really. Is there something about God that is internally inconsistent? No. The coherence of theism is beautiful. God's attributes all uh, are logically consistent. The idea of God is logically internally consistent. It's only if you're presupposing naturalism that you wouldn't want to include God in the equation. Quentin Smith, philosopher from Western Michigan University, writes, quote, the most reasonable belief is this, that we came from nothing, by nothing, and for nothing. That's the most reasonable belief. The universe came from nothing, non-being to being. And how did this happen? By no agent, nothing caused it, and for nothing, for no cosmic purpose. Folks, as William Lane Craig likes to say, this is worse than magic. Because at least with magic, you've got a magician pulling a rabbit out of a hat. This is saying there's no magician, there's no hat, it's just a rabbit that pops into existence from nothing. Years ago, atheists would say to Christians, how can you believe, how can you believe that? That God created something from nothing. He can just create things from nothing. Today, Christians are asking atheists, how can you believe nothing created something from nothing? See, the shoe is on the other foot. At least we have, in the words of Paul Davies, a causative agency, a God who's infinite all-powerful, who can, of course he could create something from nothing. That's child's play. How about this claim? Nothing created something. Nothing created something? Really. Nothing created something. Any miracle in the Bible pales in comparison to that claim right there. If you held a gun to my head and said, believe nothing created something, I couldn't believe it. I could say I believed it. I could tell you I believed it, but I can't believe, I cannot believe that. A talking donkey, way easier to believe. The Red Sea parting, way easier to believe. Uh, any, any miracle you look at, a flood, anything, you've got a God that can do that, right? But nothing creating something, I can't believe that. But this might astonish you, that's not the claim being made. As outrageous as that claim is, that's not the claim. The claim is not that nothing created something, it's that nothing created everything. And if you can believe that, you can believe anything. I want you to reflect on that. You know, skeptics are always saying, well, what about this part of the Bible? I don't believe that. What about that part of the Bible? I don't believe that. On the periphery, on the, on the skin of the Christian worldview, we've got problems. We've got Balaam's donkey talking. Eh, that's a problem. What is this, Shrek? Huh? Uh, that's a problem. You know, we've got the rising of the saints, Matthew 27, going into drill. That's a problem. That's a problem. Yeah. At the core of the Christian worldview, we are rock solid. The existence of the universe, the fine-tuning of the universe, the origin of first life, the existence of objective moral values and duties, free will, consciousness, 
uh, the evidence for Jesus of Nazareth, the historicity of the New Testament document. We are at the center, meaning, purpose, significance. I could elaborate on and on. S uh, skepticism, naturalism, atheism has no explanation for the core of human existence and uh, actually the universe itself. But on the periphery, they look really good. On the periphery, they can say, what about Noah's flood? What about, uh, that? what about that? Okay, they can kind of poke holes at the Christian worldview, but all it is is throwing darts at a giant, okay? A naturalistic worldview is not a giant at all, quite the opposite. Well, let's see if we can bring this together here. How can we communicate this in a clear and concise way? That's the big picture, the evidence for the Big Bang. And initially, I was going to start with this, make it more complex and make it more complex still. But I thought this wouldn't have much substance if we didn't first start with the evidence. So we're going to wrap it up this way rather than open with it. I would argue that we should use concise statements to explain these complex concepts. People will not listen to us talk for 45 minutes about the evidence for the Big Bang. They just simply won't. So using statements like this, I don't have enough faith to believe that nothing created everything. If you said I'll give you a million dollars to believe that, I would, I would tell you I'd, I'd take the million dollars, but I, I can't, I'm sorry. I, I mean, believing that a leprechaun is hovering over my head right now, I can't, be, I can't believe that, all right? And believing that nothing created everything, I don't believe, I, I don't have enough faith to believe that. Another way to put this is the origin of the material universe cannot come from within the material universe. That's metaphysically absurd. That's like saying, I'm my own father. That's absurd. You, you can't have the cause of the universe itself come from within the universe itself, because that's the very thing that we're trying to explain. A natural cause cannot be the explanation for the origin and existence of nature. What we're trying to explain is the totality of nature. You can't have a natural cause within nature explain nature. Or finally, my favorite, a big bang requires a big banger. That comes from J.P. Moreland. I love that. What could cause the big bang? We need a causative agency to bring the universe into existence. Or we could ask key questions that would generate dialogue. For example, I like this question, what are the odds that the ancient Jews and Christians would be right that the universe had a beginning? Everyone else believed that it was eternal. Incidentally, John Lennox asked this to Richard Dawkins in a debate to which Dawkins replied, well, they had a 50-50 chance. 50-50, as though it's a coin flip. No, 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 no. Everyone believed it was one way and had a predisposition to the one direction. And here we have the Jews and Christians pointing in the different direction. In fact, the only people that held this view were people that borrowed from the Bible. Uh, Islam, Mormonism, offshoots of Christianity, they hold to the beginning of the universe. Uh, Mormonism, not as much, but uh, they hold at least in, in principle that this universe had a beginning. Their problem is they believe in multiple universes from multiple gods going back to eternity, which brings you to an actual infinite number of universes. That's beside the point. Anyways, if the universe had a beginning, what would best explain this? So I'm not saying the universe did have a beginning, but let's just say that the consensus of modern cosmologists is correct and the universe did have a space-time matter energy beginning. What do you think would be the best explanation of such a thing? Or why would we exclude God as the possible cause of the universe? Like if theism can help explain something in our world that naturalism can't explain, why wouldn't we appeal to theism? We could appeal to deductive reasoning. This is the approach of William Lane Craig. He likes this because it's very simple. So he puts it into a deductive argument form. Everything that begins to exist has a cause. The universe began to exist. Therefore, three, the universe has a cause. What's good about this approach is it's internally valid. It's sound. Each of the premises are true. And arguably, it's cogent. Arguably, it's cogent. The difficulty that I've seen isn't with William Lane Craig or with deductive logic. It's that most people don't know logic. As sad as that is for me to 
uh, utter with my lips. They don't understand logic, so they think it's a trick. So as a practitioner, using this for people, they get very uncomfortable because giving them a logical syllogism makes them kind of uh, scared. But this is a great argument, and I like that it's very simple. Two premises and a conclusion. Which premise is wrong? Do you believe that everything that begins to exist has a cause is wrong? Do you believe that the universe began to exist is wrong? Well, no, I, I agree with premise one. Well, what about two? I agree with premise two. Well, then it necessarily follows that premise three, the conclusion is true. If all men are mortal and Socrates is a man, it necessarily follows that Socrates is mortal. So which one of these do you want to pick on? I wouldn't want to be on either horn of that dilemma, would you? That things pop into existence from nothing or that the universe didn't begin to exist. My favorite is appealing to abductive reasoning. What's abductive? Well, this is like Sherlock Holmes. Sherlock Holmes. Great show. Um, I heard they wrote a book after it. <laughs> That's my one joke for the night. All right. What is the best explanation of the data? You're looking, you know, Sherlock goes into a crime scene and he's, I like it in the new show, he, there's numbers over everything and he's measuring everything with his eyes and, you know, he's putting it all together. And what best explains the data? Is it atheism? Ah, uh, theos, no God. Is it pantheism? Everything is God, like pangea, one continent, everything is God. Is it polytheism? Many gods, poly, meaning many. Or is it theism? To me, no God, that makes the least amount of sense. Pantheism has the same problem because instead of it being one substance, being matter and energy, like naturalism, the one substance is God itself, not a personal God, an impersonal God like an energy or a force, but that couldn't create anything. Otherwise, there would be a point at which God itself did not exist. Pantheism can't explain it. Polytheism, hardly anyone believes that anymore. I don't see that making a comeback. And the idea that we have finite deities bringing a universe into existence, um, that leaves us with theism as the best option. All right, let me pause for questions at this point. What did you have to share? Go ahead. Good question. So if infinity is an absurd concept, but we believe in an infinite God, does that mean that God is an absurd concept, right? Well, the way I would respond is this, is in the first example, I'm referring to an infinite set. So an infinite set of batteries, let's say. When I refer to God as being omnipotent, all-powerful, or infinitely powerful, I'm not saying that God has an infinite set of batteries that generates his power. I'm saying that he's qualitatively infinite. So in the first case, I'm referring to quantitative infinities, an actual infinite set. In the second, I'm referring to qualitative infinity. So his attribute is immaterial. Um, for example, power or knowledge or love. These are immaterial attributes. You can't count them but he has this to the infinite degree. So it's um, using the same word, but using it in two different senses. Yeah, there you go. Well said. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, we're going to talk about that as well. But I will say this. Um, yeah, the question is, how can these scientists who are so brilliant explain this? Some of them will uh, equivocate, which means they use the same word in two different fashions. You know, like uh, define time. Uh, it's a magazine. No, that's using the word time in two different ways. One is uh, an improper noun, one's a proper noun, right? So they would say, yeah, the, the beginning of the universe was from a quantum field from nothing. Well, what's nothing? A broiling sea of burbling energy. Right? So you say, well, where did that originate? And that must have come from uh, the, the singularity. Well, yeah, but we're talking about, well, they're just describing after the singularity occurred. Others who are a little bit more consistent, in my estimation, would say that before the Big Bang, it's just, it is just a brute fact. It's, um, you, you, you can't go behind it. There's nothing behind the curtain. We don't know how to explain it, and there's no use trying. 
I think that's at least consistent. I believe, yeah, it's more honest. However, I would say that would get rid of the principle of sufficient reason. If they aren't willing to accept the Big Bang, um, why won't they hold the same view on Little Bangs? Every other effect has a cause, except for the biggest effect of them all. Uh, that, that just seems to me to be, um, I believe in brute facts and there's necessity to certain things. That's not one of them. This shows it's contingent.